Okay, welcome and good morning. Uh, we are right now in the time of the pandemic the, of the coronavirus or COVID-19 as some people know it. And so I am currently speaking to an empty room. And uh, that's what uh, is happening in many places of worship uh, these days with the uh, limitation on how we can gather with other people. And so uh, this morning we want to give a message on the hope of the resurrection. And we are at that time of year uh, where we commemorate the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, many people refer to it as Good Friday. And we also celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the grave bodily. And many people refer to that as Easter. Um, and there is a debate um, as to whether the, the Lord actually died on a Friday or not. And I think it's interesting uh, sometimes to think about that, but it's really not an important issue. Um, there are some who think he died on a Thursday, some on a Wednesday. Um, but the really important issue is that we are living in a, in a nation that recognizes this, this event in history. And that's what I, I rejoice in um, with the events of Good Friday and Easter. I am thankful to live in a land that promotes those days, not because there's anything special about the day, uh, but because it draws attention to the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in, in, in reference to that day not being an issue, in Romans 14, verse 5 and 6, uh, Paul reminds us, he says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. And so some people esteem Good Friday higher than another day, and some people esteem uh, Easter Sunday higher than another day. And, and as long as they're doing it with the right motive to glorify the Lord, then I'm fine with that. And other people tend to minimize those days. But as long as they're acknowledging the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, then I would allow uh, everyone to be persuaded in their own mind. But I am thankful to live in a country that still openly recognizes uh, these days because of the attention that it draws to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so right now we are living in this time of, of pandemic uh, where there's fear uh, going on, a lot of turmoil, a lot of emotions. And so as we look at this account, we're going to briefly look at the account of the suffering and death of Christ, just very briefly, and then the resurrection. Maybe we can relate to the, the fear and the turmoil somewhat going on in the minds and hearts of the disciples as they went through that time because of their lack of understanding. They were confused. They were scared regarding the events leading up to the, the death of Christ. And so um, maybe we can relate to that in a, in a small way. Because we too are subject to, to the emotions of, of confusion, uh, fear, and, and a lack of certainty, um, a, not understanding sometimes what, what, what is going on. But I want us to, as we think about this and think about the emotions that are going on, let's understand the power and the impact of the resurrection. And I want us to notice the impact the resurrection itself had on the disciples. And then we will turn our attention in the end of this lesson on how the resurrection can impact us. So if you turn to Matthew chapter 26, Matthew chapter 26 and verse 47, this is the account of where Jesus is being um, captured by Judas and then we're going to follow into the, to some of his trial before Pilate. And, and look what goes on here. Um, 
specifically with his disciples. These are people who loved Jesus, people who administered with him, who were uh, following along with him in his ministry. And notice the thing, how they behave in this situation. And in verse 46, we're kind of breaking in here, is where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and Judas is on his way with a band of people to betray him. And Jesus says to his disciples, Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priest and elders of the people. And so here's a great multitude coming at Jesus. Now if we jump over to verse 55, it says, In that same hour said Jesus to the multitudes. So it's the same group that's come out to capture Him, to take Him captive, to present Him to the authorities. He says, Are you come out as against a thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you, teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then notice this sentence. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Those that had been near to him, those that had ministered with him, those who were, were on his team, and they were even friends, good friends. And at this moment, they forsook him and fled. That is interesting as we ponder that. The amount of, of fear and confusion that they exhibited here at this time. Now verse 57, and, and they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And that, that's fascinating as we picture this, the disciples, when the band seemed to come for Jesus' arrest, the disciples forsook Him and fled, and then Peter follows afar off. He is afraid. He's clearly afraid. And he follows Him afar off, and he goes in with the servants of the palace, trying to remain obscure, but wanting to get close enough to witness what's going to happen. And he views it as the end. It says he did this to see the end. <clears throat> For, and whatever that means, Jesus' um, ministry, in Peter's view, his ministry is all coming to an end. This is the final, the final thing. And if we look down in verse 69... Matthew 26, verse 69. It says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also wast with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. But when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And then Peter went out and wept bitterly. And so there he remembers some things. He is ashamed of his actions because he is reminded that the Lord did predict his betrayal. And at the time, he denied that he would ever de de deny the Lord or betray the Lord. And yet we find at this time, because of his fear, because of his confusion and lack of certainty, the lack of understanding, he did just that. He betrayed one of his best friends and his Lord, 
someone who he had absolute confidence in and he trusted, the one whom he believed to be the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, when, when the heat was turned on, when the persecution came, he fled and then he watched from afar off and he denied having any contact or knowing even who he was. Now, that's not just Peter. It is interesting that the, the Scripture here singles out Peter. And we're going to turn to the book of Acts here shortly to see what a dramatic turnaround the resurrection created in Peter. But Peter was not alone. All the disciples had forsook him and fled. And over in John chapter 20, another account uh, of... And we won't spend time with the whole account of the... Uh, the trial of, of Christ and, and then also His resurrection. But here after the resurrection of Christ, before the disciples were really understanding what was going on, in John chapter 20 and verse 19, and here is Jesus appearing before the disciples and, and they still don't understand what's taking place here with the resurrection. They, they're, they're just afraid that the body has been stolen away. They're not convinced that He is bodily resurrected yet. And in verse 19 it says, Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And what fitting words, because clearly they were lacking peace. So his first words are, peace be unto you. But it says they were gathered together, the doors were shut for fear of the Jews. And so here we see his, his disciples, those whom he had um, led in, in a ministry for three years, those who had went out to Israel and preached the gospel of the kingdom the good news of the coming kingdom with Jesus being the king. They had performed miracles. They had helped raise the dead, cast out demons, and performed many signs and wonders in Israel. And here these same men are cowering in fear behind closed doors. Now, the resurrection changed everything for them. And before we uh, look at Acts chapter 4, I invite your attention to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, speaking of Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same. He, he also took part of flesh and blood. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And I find that interesting. Jesus Christ came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. You see, ultimately, fear is bondage. Fear leads to bondage. And so, without having an understanding of the resurrection, the, the life after this one, without having a certainty, a hope in those things, people are in bondage. And even, even the disciples, uh, to a certain extent, were in bondage. They lived, and we must not forget that they lived under the law. They were under that old covenant principle of the law, and the law worketh wrath. The law works fear. Because the law points out our sinfulness. And we know that there is a judgment coming. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. And so even among the disciples, those who had trusted Christ, because of their confusion over the resurrection and what it had accomplished, they were still subject to the fear of death. The fear of dying, as it mentions in this verse. 
And so they, they would have understood in a measure the truth of a resurrection. Uh, all the Old Testament saints believed that they would be resurrected. Job says that in the latter day, I know that even after the worms eat my body, meaning he would die and go into the grave, he knew that at some point he would see his Redeemer in his flesh because he believed in a resurrection. But they didn't understand what the resurrection of Christ would accomplish. They never understood that their, their Messiah, their Lord, would need to go through a resurrection. And so they didn't understand what all was being accomplished as far as putting away sin regarding the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. And so they still had this measure of fear regarding dying. And that fear actually is a good thing as we think about it. The fear of death is a necessary component. It is God-ordained. It is God-ordained that men would be subject to bondage, the bondage of the fear of dying. Because as we think about that, that's what drives people to seek out the truth. That's why people seek an answer as to what happens after this life. Not only that, but can you imagine what the suicide rate would be if there was no fear of dying? We live in a world where there's hardship, there's turmoil, there's pain and there's suffering. And what keeps people going in life and pressing on is that they don't want to die. If they did not fear the death, then when the pain got too great, the turmoil um, becomes uh, dominant in our life, think how many people would just end their own life to escape that. But the bondage of the fear of death is what keeps people. And so that is, is actually a good thing. But the resurrection changes that. The resurrection changes our fear of death. It changes our perspective of death. Because with the resurrection we are no longer fearful of dying and, and standing in judgment. We realize that we are just simply moving from one life to another. <clears throat> so we look in Acts chapter 4, and here is, I'm going to read a portion of this in Acts chapter 4 so that we can grasp the, the stark contrast of Peter and the disciples in their attitude now, now that they've understood the, the resurrection and what it has accomplished and the fact that the Lord has, has now not only resurrected, but He has ascended into heaven and He is awaiting His return on the prophetic time clock, the prophetic timetable to play out. And so as He's awaiting that, Peter and the disciples have a, a confidence and a boldness here I want us to notice. Acts chapter 4, verse, start in verse 1. And it says, As they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they, the disciples, taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they said, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now that's an interesting contrast to Peter and the disciples fleeing when Jesus was under arrest and standing afar off watching the trial cowering in fear, even after the resurrection, cowering in fear behind closed doors. And here, Jesus and, or Peter and the disciples are under arrest. And as they're hauled in before the authorities, we no longer see them cowering in any way. But they are speaking with such boldness and almost so confrontational that the authorities marvel. The high priest marvel. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Verse 14, And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. So here they're giving a, a mandate, telling the disciples what to do. But look at the boldness again. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And so here we have a detailed account of how bold and persistent, how confident the disciples were now because the resurrection had changed things. So as we think about that, there's, there's three broad categories that I've thought about that changed with the disciples in their, in their thinking and their understanding that... that so we can see this contrast. The resurrection brought about three changes. Number one, they no longer feared dying. They were no longer in bondage to that fear. And see, fear tends to control you. That's what bondage is. Bondage is when you're being controlled by something outside yourself. And that's what fear is. Fear is something coming from without and it's controlling you. And so they no longer had that fear of dying. They, they begin to understand that this resurrection would accomplish something great and magnificent. And so the, they no longer feared dying. They weren't threatened by it at all. In fact, they put their life on the line speaking back to the authorities. Speaking truth, they weren't trying to be um, uh, snarky, but they were, they were speaking truth and they were speaking it boldly, knowing that their life was on the line, that those authorities would gladly end their life if they had an excuse. So that, first of all, they no longer feared dying. Secondly, they now more fully understood the Scriptures. So the resurrection brought a, 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 it ended the fear of dying, and the resurrection brought a completion to their understanding where they could understand the scriptures. And we won't turn there, but I'm reminded of the account on the, of the two people on the road to Emmaus. And this is right after the resurrection of Christ, before he had fully revealed himself to everyone. And as they traveled along, they were downtrodden, they were discouraged. And they talked among themselves about how the, the, uh, the events of Jesus' trial and His death just dashed their hopes. And Jesus, 
unbeknownst to them who he was, he joins them as they travel along. And as they share with him all the events that have taken place, it says he began to open the scriptures to them. And so he took them back to the prophets and the Psalms and pointed out how they all pointed to him and how it was according to scripture and it was necessary that he suffer and die and be raised again. And then as they... Uh, as the, the light, came, light bulb came on, they understood who Jesus was and He departed out of their midst. Then they said, Did not our hearts burn within us as He opened the Scriptures to us? Because the opening of the Scriptures, the understanding of the Scriptures, instead of it being these dark sayings, these unrelated passages that we can't fit, fit together, and there's confusion, there's frustration with, with the Scriptures being so complicated and so hard to understand. That brings a sense of confusion, of fear, a lack of confidence. The resurrection largely ended that for the disciples. <clears throat> now they knew. Now they understood the Scriptures. <clears throat> In fact, it, it, became, it came to the point... We're back in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, when Peter first stood up to address the big audience there gathered for the feast, and he's addressing them regarding Christ, His death and His resurrection, he says this, and this is the day of Pentecost, he says this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Peter's no longer guessing at things. He's no longer thinking, this is my opinion, this is my view. He says, this is that. Peter has confidence. He understands the Scriptures now. And that's one thing that the resurrection does. It caused them to understand Scripture and its precise fulfillment. And then number three... The disciples now lived with a keen, a very keen sense of their purpose. They existed. Their life's purpose now was to testify of the risen Christ. And so it was, it was their life's purpose no longer revolved around their livelihoods, around the fishing or the tax collecting or whatever uh, capacity they, they served in for their occupation, their central life purpose was to testify of the risen Christ. That gave them a sense of purpose that no one could take away. The fear of dying did not take that away. And so the resurrection accomplished those things for them and dramatically changed them. Now what about us? Do we live in fear and intimidation? What does the resurrection mean to us? <clears throat> well, first of all, similar to the disciples, we as believers should not fear dying. And as we know, the, the, the gospel, it's laid out in 1, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And I'll just read that passage. But the resurrection is an integral part of the gospel by which we are saved. We're saved, yes, by, uh, by the death of Christ, the payment for our sins, but then also by the resurrection. In Romans chapter 4, it says that He was delivered for our offenses. Speaking of Christ, He was delivered for our offenses and He was raised again for our justification. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And so here we have the 
the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for our sins. And so it's, it's not just the fact, like the disciples or the Old Testament saints, they believed in some sort of resurrection. But that alone doesn't take away the fear of dying. And many people in the world today believe in some sort of resurrection, but that alone does not take away the fear of dying. What can take away the fear of dying, what does take away the fear of dying, is when we understand the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and what that means to us. Because on the cross, He paid the penalty for my sins. When I trust Him for that, and when I believe that He was buried, that is a, a, a means by which He went into the, into the grave in His physical body, signifying a putting away, permanently putting away of sins in His flesh. Those were not His sins that He was putting away. It's my sins and your sins. And then He was raised again to newness of life with a glorified, resurrected body. That is what we stake our confidence in. That's why we no longer fear judgment, judgment from God. We no longer fear death itself because we are, we've already been uh, dealt with as far as our sin by Christ. The judgment against our sin has already fully been dealt with by Christ. And so we can rejoice in the fact that because of His resurrection and all that He has accomplished, we too will be resurrected with a new glorified body. And we're just trading one life for a much better life. And so that is good news. That can give us boldness. We're no longer in the, in the bondage of that fear of dying. And secondly, we need to understand the Scriptures. So just like the resurrection and Jesus expounding additional things to the disciples, it brought a, a clarity of understanding in their minds regarding the Scriptures. We too need a better understanding of Scriptures. And in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, we kind of break in. We could spend a lot of time with this, this thought, and, and we won't. But we need to understand that we are living in the dispensation of the grace of God. We are not living in the tribulation dispensation. We are not living under the Old Testament law, under the Old Covenant, where wrath and judgment came because of sin and rebellion. And we're not living in the future tribulation, when God's wrath and judgment will again come because of sin and rebellion. We are living in the dispensation of grace. And knowing that will give us confidence. It gives us clarity. It, it causes us to rejoice in the Scripture because we see the bigger picture where we fit in. And we understand that God today, no matter if we're in this, this uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic or all, all the other bad things that can happen to us, we can rest assured that th it's not the judgment of God. We are not suffering from the wrath of Almighty God. He is not out to get us, to straighten us out because of our sin. Yes, He's there to help us, but He's not out there to judge and pour out His wrath upon us. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. It says, But God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than... So not only is that great, God commending His love toward us while we were yet sinners, that is great, but verse 9, much more, being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. So now He's saying not only did God commend His love toward us in that Christ died for us, but now for you and I who are justified already justified, declared righteous before God. So we've already been saved in that sense. If we've tr trusted the gospel of Christ, we are saved, we are justified. But notice, if we shall be, future tense, saved from wrath through Him. So see, the salvation here is not one of saved, 
unto eternal life with Christ. This is being saved from God's outpouring of wrath. So we who are justified, we who are members of the body of Christ, we need not fear the wrath of God. Because since we are justified, because we are in Christ, we also have been saved from any future outpouring of God's wrath. <clears throat> and we can turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to see a parallel passage to that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, <clears throat> verse 9, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is not necessarily true of the unbelievers living in the world. That certainly will not be true after we are called home through the rapture and the tribulation is introduced to the people remaining on earth. But it is true for us. God has not appointed us to wrath, but He has appointed us to salvation from wrath by the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> And then back in Romans, we'll look at a couple passages again. Romans chapter 8, and in verse 31. Paul goes through a list of things here in Romans chapter 8 of how we suffer, how we groan within ourselves. We are just waiting for the redemption of this body, which is a, a body of suffering. And so he says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And that is a rhetorical question that Paul is asking, trying to get the audience, get us to think. If God is for us, who can be against us? So if God has provided these things for us, if He has provided for our um, salvation from wrath, He has provided for our salvation from our sin. He has provided from our sal uh, salvation from eternal destruction. And, and there's many more things that He has provided for us. If He is for us in those things, who can be against us? Who can take those away? And the answer is no one. No one. We are secure in that. <clears throat> And in Romans chapter 11, verse 13, we're going to get a, a, a picture here of why we can trust that. Romans chapter 11, verse 13, Paul says, For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify mine office. You see, there was a unique revelation the revelation of the mystery given to the Apostle Paul for us Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. We are living in the dispensation of grace. We're not living under the old covenant. We are not living under the new covenant. Those were both given to Israel. We are living in the time of the mystery. Understanding that gives us clarity. It gives us confidence. It gives us boldness where we understand how the Scriptures all fit together. And it's a beautiful, a beautiful thing when people understand that. And we understand that by believing what Paul wrote. Because when, when Paul talks about being delivered from wrath and, and uh, not appointed unto wrath, and he talks about looking for the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he talks about being the apostle of the Gentiles and delivering uh, or, or being... Uh, committed with this ministry, the mystery of Christ, the dispensation of the grace of God. He, he, he says all those things were given through Him for us, Gentiles in the body of Christ. <clears throat> that is the key to understanding the Scriptures. Because if you don't understand that, then there, there's all these uh, uh, people in Christendom around us in the world today that are fearful. They go back to the Old Testament and they look at the judgments of God and then they look at the hardship coming on the United States of America and they think God is judging our nation. And they live in fear because they're putting themselves in the wrong place in Scripture. And then also, there are those who think they're going to go through the Great Tribulation. 
And so every time something bad comes or at a national level or even as a, as a world, they all of a sudden are enclosed in fear. They're in bondage again because of the terrible things and suffering the wrath of God. That would be very scary. But when we clearly understand the Scriptures, we realize that we are not living in those times. Even th though things are bad, we live in an evil, a present evil world, Galatians 1 says. But we're not living under the wrath of God. And so we can take great comfort in that. The answer to that, our understanding is 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. Understanding where what Scriptures were written directly to us the Apostle Paul is our Apostle. His epistles are written directly to us, and so all the Bible is for our learning. But specifically, we find that he has the information to equip us in this dispensation of grace. <clears throat> Thirdly, so first of all, we need to um, not fear the, the, the bondage of death because of the resurrection of Christ and what is accomplished. Secondly, we understand the Scriptures. As we understand the Scriptures and how we fit into it, it brings peace and boldness and confidence. And then thirdly, we need to understand our purpose in life. And just like the disciples, their purpose in life now was the to testify of the risen Christ. We too should testify of the risen Christ. But yet now we know more than even the disciples knew at that time. With the, with the ministry of the Apostle Paul came new information, more information, the revelation of the mystery. And so now we also testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Living in the dispensation of the grace of God, we testify of the grace of God. In Philippians 1, verse 21, it says, For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. So Paul says his, as he, if, if he finds himself living, praise the Lord. It's about Christ. He's living for Christ. But if he finds himself at, on the threshold of dying, so be it. That's gain. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Trading this lo difficult life for a much better one. <clears throat> because of the resurrection, we come out a winner. It's, it's a win-win either way, live or die. But we have to understand, as we think about these things, and we think about the, the bad things that are happening in the world, we realize that time is short. And we need to redeem the time. And I am reminded of that more and more, that time is short. We need to do the best we can with what little time we have. And here in Philippians also, as we look on down, uh, that was Philippians 1.21, but if we look at verse 28, Paul says, in nothing, he's admonishing the Philippians. He says, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And I think there's a little uh, glimpse here of what happens when we as a Christian become terrified. And this specifically, I believe, is dealing with persecution because Paul is in prison. And, but I think the principle applies if we're terrified about anything. In nothing terrified by your adversaries. Why? Why should we not be terrified? Because it is a testimony. It is an evident token of perdition. People who are, te are terrified, if we look at Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 28, it says, In nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And so, to be terrified of your adversaries is testifying of the fact that there is a perdition. There is some sort of destruction that you are fearful of. And for the Christian, it should not be that way because there is not a judgment that we have to be afraid of any longer. There is not a fear of dying that should exist. And so for the, the Christian, we should be 
in nothing terrified. Because that points, that is an evidence of salvation and that of God. You see, the unbelieving world doesn't realize this, but when they are afraid of dying, they, they are testifying. In other words, as this scripture says, that is an evident token of their perdition. And their perdition is real. There is a perdition that they should be afraid of, but not for the Christian. Therefore, we should not be terrified of that. We should not be terrified of the, the persecution, the, um, the fear of man, the fear of dying. That should not be for the Christian because when we do not have that, that um, fear and that uh, the issue of being terrified by our adversaries, that is a token, an evident token of our salvation. That God has saved us. We are in right standing with God. We don't, we don't fear at all the time when we can see God, the Lord Jesus Christ, face to face. So, in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. And so, and not only that, so not only is there a possibility of dying and being, with, being raised again, and being eternally with Christ. But we have the imminent rapture of the saints that could happen at any moment. And, and this is our resurrection. For all believers in the body of Christ, from the Apostle Paul's day up until current, all believers are awaiting a specific resurrection, and it's called the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. That is our resurrection. And so we can look forward to that. That is something that Paul calls a blessed hope. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. The absolute certainty of the resurrection and the absolute certainty of salvation, our salvation, for we who have trusted in Christ is what empowers us. It empowers us to live for Christ, to live with a sense of purpose. It gives our lives meaning while we're here. And it gives our lives depth. And it gives us um, something to live for that is to live for Christ. But if we no longer live and we're subject to death, then that's just gain for the believer. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word and that we have your word available, that we can study it and to learn from it. Father, we are thankful uh, for these things that we don't have to fear death. We can rejoice in the resurrection. We can rejoice in a, in a full understanding of your word. And we can rejoice in a full purpose, a complete and a... Uh, edifying purpose for our lives while we remain here on earth. And so, Father, we do rejoice in these things. We're thankful for, the, uh, for all that has been accomplished on the cross of Christ for us. And God forbid that we should glory in anything save the cross of Christ. And so, Father, we uh, rejoice this morning in these things, and we look forward to the day when we'll be gathered home to live eternally with you in your presence. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.